thanks very much for inviting me to speak at uh, Liberty Forum this year. I've actually come all of the way from Ireland to be here, and the reason I wanted to come and I was so excited to come is that when I first heard about the Free State Project, I realized that this was a group of people for whom self-determination was very important, and who were willing not just to talk about what other people should do, but actually put their money where their mouth was and do something themselves. And as you get older, you realize that that quality is not as common as you once would have thought it was, and you learn to appreciate it when you see it. So it's really good to be here. What I'm going to talk about today is decentralized decision making and how we can put the individual back into the center of politics. So the average person only casts a vote in a national election 12 times over the course of their entire lives. And I think we can all agree that that is a very, very low level of participation in politics that it wouldn't be hard to improve on. But what I'm going to talk about today is kind of a more fundamental change than that. And I think it's important when you're talking about fundamental change to kind of explain to people how you got to the conclusions that you did. In my particular case, I think something that played a major role in my life is that I knew that my grandparents, and this is me helping my grandfather paint when I was little, I knew that my grandparents uh, and all of my maternal relatives, in fact, had come from Spain, moved to Argentina, and eventually moved to Canada. And I knew that the reason they had done so was primarily this guy, General Franco. So from the time I was little, I had an understanding of military dictatorship and persecution that wasn't abstract, but in fact, was something that had affected my uh, closest relatives. But I also knew that even though they at times were very afraid of this military dictatorship for good reason, that there was a certain normalization to their lives. They'd gone to the bakery, they'd had to go to the dentist, they had um, even sometimes positive things to say about the military regime, such as that there was no crime. So that's something that stuck with me and made me realize that there's not a magic way of coming to and acquiring political power or holding political power. There's very much a mechanics to that situation all of the time. And that interest really stayed with me while I was studying. I studied law at the University of Göttingen in Germany, which is on the left, and I wrote my PhD at Trinity College Dublin on the right. And while I was doing that, I really uh, kept studying the mechanics of power and particularly became interested in how political power is exercised in Western democracies. And what I found out was really so different than our common perceptions of democracy that it changed my ideas of self-governance and democracy pretty permanently. So when I first started, people would say to me, why would you want to like, study democracy? It's so boring, everybody knows what democracy is, it's elections, it's human rights, it's great, it's spreading around the world, uh, bringing freedom to people, why would you want to study that, much less try to pick holes in it? But I think over the past few years, it's become more and more obvious that there is something very wrong with how we do politics, and in fact, you can hardly open a newspaper today without seeing an article asking what's the matter with democracy. So when you ask people that question, they'll usually say one or more of the following things or similar things. I call them the usual suspects, and I call them that because they're very surface level problems. And what I mean by that is that they're things we've known about for a long time, and they continue to exist even though people find them problematic. If you take gerrymandering, for example, if you look at some of the districts in the United States, you can see this is not really a normal way to draw an electoral boundary. Few people would dispute this is a problem, yet it's been going on for decades, if not over, over 100 years, uh, without being resolved. Similarly, corruption. You know, it's very common to see academic articles or newspaper articles saying there is corruption, which most people would agree is a bad thing, uh, that um, uh, we should, and that we should do something about it, which again, most people would agree to. As we used to say when I was in high school, no shit, Sherlock. Everybody knows that. But the question is really, why do these issues exist and why do they persist? What is under the surface holding up this iceberg of problems? So that's what I looked at. Um, and when people say, you know, 
if only, you know, democracy would be great, if only the right people would win, or if only uh, there were more parties. It actually reminds me of a story from Greek history, and we're gonna get a bit more into Greek history later on. And according to that story, Philip of Macedon, who is Alexander the Great's father, once sent a threatening message to the nearby kingdom of Sparta. And he said, look Spartans, buckle under now, because if I enter Sparta with my army, I will raise your capital to the ground. And so the Spartans thought about that for a little while, and they sent back one word, if. So that's what I always think of when people say, well, you know, if only the right people would win, if only the media was better, I think, yes, if, but it's not. Why isn't it that way? That's what we need to understand. So I tried to look for a society that didn't have these issues, because I thought if I can find a society that doesn't have those issues in it, I'll know what's causing them in our society. And I looked far and wide, and I eventually ended up in what I thought of at the time as the dork-ridden section of the library, the classic section. So the study of Greece and Rome. And only desperation drove me there, but I actually stayed for two years because what these guys had to say about democracy and about politics was really, really interesting. So Aristotle, for example, said elections are a little bit better than slavery. You know, like a bit. Not too much, but a little bit. Solon, who lived in Athens at a different time than Aristotle, said, laws, they don't really do always what you want them to do because they're really good at catching the little guy while big and powerful people get away with bloody murder. Uh, so if you want to create a just society, laws alone are not the way to do that. And by the way, I should know because I'm known to history as Solon the lawgiver. Cicero, uh, who was a famous Roman orator and litigator, said elections are really just a, a hoax. Uh, they give you the feeling like you're in control and that you're doing something. But at the end of the day, you don't have uh, the power to decide on policy points. You don't interpret laws. So really, it's just a comforting illusion when you get down to it. And these were not odd sentiments. These were actually the going opinion in ancient times. And in fact, it was the going opinion up until after the First World War, that if you wanted to create a free society, much less a democracy, which means people power, then holding elections together with a fixed legal system would not be a good way to go about doing that. And the reason for that was that the electoral system was an oligarchy. In fact, it was a very particular kind of oligarchy that centralized wealth and power in the hands of a very few people. And if you weren't born into that group of very few people, good luck getting in. So I thought, how can we, you know, let me see, what does that mean in modernity? Um, so I tried to see, you know, what, what, how that could apply to modern life. Um, and what I found out was quite interesting. Um, there was actually a study done by an American judge in the 1970s. He looked at congressional elections and he noticed that the person who spent the most on their election campaign won their seat in 80% of all cases. And he also noticed that if one side outspent the other by a factor of two to one or more, they won their seat 93% of the time. And then he noticed if one side outspent the other by a factor of five to one or more, they won their seat in 100% of all cases. So you can see a very clear pattern. And I thought, okay, well, that's interesting. But we all know the 70s were a while ago. <laughs> we better update this. Uh, yeah, <laughs> oh my. So I looked at uh, 84 congressional races for 2012, and I picked those races because the seat had changed hands. And when that happens, usually there's a lot of dissatisfaction with the incumbent, so I thought maybe money will play less of a role in those elections than normal. But what I found out actually shocked even me because the pattern was exactly the same pretty much as it had been 34 years ago. So there'd been virtually no change. And I also looked at other countries. I looked at countries that have um, spending limits, for example, in campaign, because people often think that spending limits are uh, the answer to this quite clear pattern. But the pattern persists 
even in very, very small countries like Ireland that have very, very low spending limits. You can see this pattern persisting. The amount of money spent is lower, but the pattern is still the same. And you can see every few hundred euros making a difference to someone's chance of being uh, elected. So, okay, so we've got not just a vague relationship between money and winning the seat, but a very quite easily calculable relationship. And of course, that has an effect on what happens after the election. There's a lot of examples of this, but one that I think is particularly good for showing the relationship between local e politics and international decisions is IMF or International Monetary Fund lending, because you can see the money kind of flowing through the system. And how it works is this. Private banks lend money to countries, and there is often a high risk that those countries will default, because usually the banks don't properly assess their capacity to repay. For example, they'll say, this country is going to have double-digit growth rate for 30 years, which is really unrealistic. Um, and they lend them a pile of money quite recklessly. And the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, also lends money to these same countries. So when you hear the term IMF loan, it's usually actually a combination of IMF money and private bank money. It's not just all coming from the IMF. And the IMF gets its money from its member states. So some of your taxes go to the IMF to participate in these loans. So often we get to the point where it becomes obvious that a country is going to default on its loan. And instead of the bank saying, okay, we made a mistake, we're going to get burned on that one, and we're going to have to be more responsible in assessing our loans in the future, they say, no, that's not going to happen. Uh, we will lobby our Congress people to increase the IMF fund, so to increase the tax money they're sending to the IMF, so that the IMF can bail out the countries in question, and no default. And the people who have studied this can notice really quite clearly um, that, for example, let's say in American, American banks are exposed to a certain country, that that lobbying will be coming from the exact place where those banks are headquartered and not, for example, from France or Germany in that case. So you can really quite trace it quite clearly to where they're headquartered and it doesn't benefit anyone except the ba this bank that doesn't want to uh, deal with its mistake, basically. That wants to be protected <coughs> from the risks of its mistake because even the people in the bailed out countries do not benefit from this. The money passes briefly through their hands and goes right back uh, to the bank. So I thought, okay, um, what we know from that, we can kind of see for that, that elections are a fulcrum whereby you use wealth to get power, which you can use to get more wealth, which you can use to get more power, to get more wealth, to get more power, to get more wealth. And it goes on and on and on and on and on. And the reason elections are so good at making that happen is because they create a bottleneck. Rick Falkring was actually talking about bottlenecks, so elections are a perfect example of a bottleneck. It doesn't matter what people think a week after an election or a week before the election. They create a specific, specific point in time for you to focus all of your resources <coughs> on, and only a few people can pass through the gates of the election and win. So if you've seen the movie 300, uh, which I didn't really like, but it did show a, another event in Greek history that's quite uh, instructive, the Battle of Thermopylae. And in the Battle of Thermopylae, 300 Greek soldiers defended the pass or gap of Thermopylae against a huge invading Persian force for a really long time. And the reason they could do that is that gaps are really easy to defend. So once you're in power, it's quite easy to prevent other people from coming through that gate uh, after you. And in fact, elections are even better than the Battle of Thermopylae because you can freeze the action. So you only have an election every two years or four years or five years, depending on the system. And while that's going on, the people on this side are having a little wealth and power party, and the people on this side can't do anything about it, right? So I thought, okay, these ancient guys like had a point. They were right about a lot of things. Um, and people often think, yes, they complained about elections, uh, but they just kept doing them because, you know, that's democracy. Au contraire, whenever these ancient people were having a discussion about politics, they were actually talking about something totally different than what we're doing today. And in fact, every time they used the word 
democracy, they meant something totally different than we do today. What they meant was democracy, which means people power. And we know most about how this system worked in Athens. And central to democracy was the citizen. So everything in Athens was initiated by the individual citizen. All state action originated with someone taking something on themselves and trying to push it out uh, to the community. And the citizen had various fora through which they could try to do that. One of them was the assembly. So the citizen could go down to the assembly and vote on all laws and decrees, or he could address the assembly and say, hey, we should you know, really pass this motion, or we shouldn't be passing this motion, as you wanted. You didn't need to buy a ticket. You didn't need to say you were coming in advance. You just showed up on the day. Um, another thing that the citizen could do would be to serve on the Council of 500, which was an administrative body composed of 500 people, which in a population of about 30 to 40,000 people was a pretty big number of people. Um, and they took care of administrative activities like setting the agenda for the assembly. And you were chosen to sit on this council by lottery. The Athenians used lotteries quite a bit and they did that in order to try to prevent corruption, which actually worked really, really well. Um, so if you wanted to be on the Council of 500 in any given year, you would say, yes, I'd like to be, I'd like to put my name forward. And then they would use a lotto machine that was actually kind of similar to a modern lottery machine. It even had little balls. Um, this is a picture of one. It's called a Claritarian. It's a little bit the worst for wear after 2,500 <laughs> years. Um, but you can see these slots here. Uh, they would have a ticket, a bronze ticket that said their name on it and where they were from because they were quite uncreative when it came to names. So you needed a bit of more information to tell people apart. And they would stick those into these slots. And then they would shake up a basket of black and white balls and pour them down a funnel on the side of the Claritarian. And if you got a black ball next to your name, you were not selected for service at that time. But if you got a white ball, you were selected for service at that time. Um, and they needed so many people to participate. Their goal in doing this wasn't to prevent people from participating. They actually reckoned that they would have had to have one quarter of all people sitting on the Council of 500 at some point in their lives just to make up the numbers. So you get uh, pretty good chances of being picked. Um, they did it basically just to prevent people being able to stay on there forever and ever and ever and making their own power base. Now, another thing you could do was you could go down to the courts. All courts in Athens were jury courts, um, and they were really, really big jury courts, compared, especially compared to the population. Even a really small jury in Athens had 201 people on it. And for big cases, like constitutional cases, there would be 6,000 people on a jury. So that would be between one-fifth and one-sixth of the citizen population. And these courts decided everything. They decided criminal matters, they decided civil matters, they decided constitutional matters. So again, if you wanted to sit on the court, you would go down and say, I want to be a, uh, sit on the court today, and you'd go through the lottery process, especially to see if, if you would serve that day and which court you would be on, because they didn't want people just inviting all their friends to be on their court. Um, and you could also, of course, litigate. So you could say, I want to litigate a case. I want to bring a case, um, a constitutional case, or a civil case, criminal case, whatever. So again, that was like the individual just said, I'm bringing out a case, um, or I'm defending the case. So that was uh, also something you could do. And last but not least, you could say, I'd like to serve as a public official. Um, so these were people who took care of the day-to-day -day activities in Athens, um, keeping the streets clean, uh, collecting public debts, making sure the weights and measures were accurate. And again, you'd say, I'd like to be a public official, and uh, you'd see, you'd put your name forward and see if you were chosen by lottery, if you would be a public official this year. So this is basically the total system. There's a few odds and ends, but uh, there's no president on top of this. There's no Congress on top of this somewhere. This is kind of the sum total of action. And people have to put themselves forward and act within that system in order for it to work at all. So you could say, well, you know, none of it's obligatory, it was all voluntary. So you could say, um, I really I really am interested in legal issues, so I go down to the court all the time and sit on the courts all the time. 
And again, they estimate that the average person would have been had to do this once every seven days just to keep up with the figures. You could say, I think all of those public duties, those little jobs like keeping the streets clean are quite important, so I put myself forward to be a public official. Or you could say, I like the limelight and I want to go down and get on center stage at the assembly and convince people to vote for the things that I think are good for our state. Uh, and you can go and do that. And there are people who could and did do that all of the time. So uh, one other point of interest here is that because there's no other government on top of this and there's no one being paid hundreds of thousands of dollars a year uh, to be the government, they paid everyone a little bit of money every time they participated. So if you would go to the assembly, you'd get a little bit of money for showing up. Um, if you sat on a jury, you'd get a little bit of money for showing up. Um, so uh, this enabled people to take a little bit of time off work to participate uh, in the day-to-day -day functions of the state. Um, and it also ensured that people could keep up the amount of work that is, it was, because it was a lot of work. So we know a lot of things about this society. Um, we know that it was a very prosperous society. So the Athenians were really pretty well off. Uh, we also know that they made very responsible decisions. So they didn't go crazy um, and have a bohemian party all the time. They were pretty down to earth, actually. Um, we know that they uh, valued education and that education became more important to them throughout the course of the democracy because if you were educated, you were better able to participate. You were better able to give a convincing speech uh, in the courts, for example. And what we also know about them is that they kind of became a little bit more humane over time. And we know this because they passed a number of laws that we still have, for example, protecting slaves more and more. But we also know this because neighboring societies thought that they were pretty crazy in how nice they were to slaves. And they would complain all the time that the Athenians were being too nice to their slaves and they were not discriminating enough against foreigners, as was proper, um, and that someone had to put an end to this. So we know this about, about ancient Athens. And we also know a few things from that about democracy. We know that democracy is direct. Um, elections are quite distorting. I know some of you have uh, developed uh, different systems of voting. Uh, when you vote for someone to decide for you, especially if you do that with millions of people and have only a few hundred seats, you get extreme <laughs> distortions, which means that it's not uncommon in electoral systems to end up governed by the person who doesn't win the vote. It's not uncommon to have smaller parties totally excluded. Things like that are pretty bread and butter to all electoral systems. After an election, we don't know much more than we did before an election. Um, we also know democracy is decentralized. We have this system of people flowing around and doing what they want to do instead of being directed to do it um, with no central points. Democracy is not for the lazy. Sometimes people miss that one. It's quite a lot of work. And the more you put into it, the more you'll get out of it. So if you were a person who went down to the assembly all the time or spoke for motions, you're having a much bigger impact on your society than someone who doesn't or someone who only occasionally participates. So democracy is meritocracy. Um, and democracy focuses on individual policies instead of gaining power. At the moment in our system, we have huge fights all of the time just to determine who is going to hold power. In a democracy, you decide directly on the issues instead of spending all of that time uh, trying just to, to get elected in order to wield power. So um, when we look back at our system, we can see, okay, this the system of Athens actually solved a lot of these problems. Um, if you're not electing representatives, it's kind of hard to gerrymander or campaign finance because it's just going nowhere, right? You're just going down to the assembly and deciding on things yourself. Um, encroachment on rights, power overreach, surveillance, those are things you have to worry a lot less about because there's no separate state that's trying to uh, maintain its own power. There's just a group of people. Um, you don't have to worry that much about two-party systems because we can agree on issue A, disagree on issue B, agree again on issue C. We don't have to join together in a party for all time just to get done the few things that we want to achieve. Laziness and ignorance are grumpy people win. Well, there's nothing to win, so. That one's kind of solved. 
Um, laziness and ignorance also quite solved because the lazy stay at home, they don't participate, so you don't have to worry uh, as much about that. And if you get out and are always around, you'll quickly cease to be as ignorant. That's something people bring up a lot when, when I talk to them about this. And last but not least, media control. When people are talking to each other all of the time, the influence of mass media is lessened because people are exchanging information directly with each other. So I thought, okay, that's, that's interesting too. I mean, it looks like it kind of solved a lot of those issues, but that would be pretty useless information if we didn't have a way to apply this to modern life. Um, and increasingly, there are a lot of software out there that enables people to make uh, decentralized decisions over large groups of people. So there's a lot of ways you can move forward to democracy. And I think that what you're doing at the Free State Project is definitely one of those. You're moving to an area where you share a lot of common uh, beliefs and you're seeking to influence politics together in that area. That's definitely one thing you can do. Um, there might be times, however, where you would think, well, we can't all be together face to face all the time, or you might want to include people in decisions who can't be there face to face. That's where these kind of things come in. So something I use myself, I ran in the last national election in Ireland as an independent. I did not get elected this time. <laughs> Uh, but I decided to run a kind of pilot project in my constituency so people could see uh, what it would be like. Uh, and I used a software called Othello for this, which was a Canadian software. And how it worked was you can put up a bunch of statements. For example, one thing I said was, should we legalize cannabis? Uh, which is something that's always on the fringes of Irish politics, but never in the middle. Um, you can put up a whole bunch of statements. I did a lot of them. Other people, people who participate, can also make suggestions for things that should be decided on. So the idea is not for it to come just from the top down, but that people can make their own suggestions and participate that way. So people could vote on this saying, you know, yeah, I really like this. No, I totally hate it. I'm somewhere in between. I'm neutral about it, whatever you want, instead of just saying yes or no. And perhaps more importantly, people could communicate with each other on this issue, say what they think should be, say um, you know what their findings are, if they think this would save us money or not save us money, that kind of thing. Um, so what we found out from doing that was really quite interesting. Um, one thing we found out was that 74% of people did support <laughs> legalizing pot, which you would never guess from our national political dialogue. Um, in addition, we found out that 89% of people would support uh, enshrining neutrality in the Constitution, which is another um, eternal uh, kind of fringe topic in Irish politics, but one that never gets uh, traction with central political parties. And we didn't just let people in our particular constituency do this, we let people in other parts of Ireland and around the world do it. <coughs> and what was very interesting is that we found out that although there was quite a difference from what people participating said they, they wanted and kind of the mainstream dialogue was, um, there was actually quite a lot of similarity between these two groups of people. So it didn't differentiate very much. And people can see how uh, what the group is deciding as well. So it's not like you don't know. It's not like a survey where you don't know what other people are saying and the person doing the survey later tells you what everyone decided. You can see it as it's ongoing. Um, so I think that's very important. So it's actually a really good way to do things that you might normally do over a survey. It's a really good way to stay in contact with your representatives on issues. It's um, a really good thing to even use within a business, for example, where you have to make a complex decision. So I know some people use this in their businesses to, for example, decide on what they should be doing as for product development and try to involve people from different branches of the business in things like that. Um, another interesting thing you can do is, is called PostWaves. This is an American developed software. And what it really excels at is allowing people who don't normally participate a lot in politics but maybe have an idea to push that idea out to the wider group. And it works by like if you have an idea, you would put it out there and it goes to random people within that group. And if they say, yeah, that's a good idea, then it gets pushed up. If you have an enormous group of people, maybe it gets pushed up to a, a larger random number of people before going to the whole community, or maybe it goes straight to the whole community. So it's a very efficient way of pushing topics up from the ground and seeing how much support they are likely to garner. Another thing that I think is really helpful, especially when it comes to um, contact with your representatives or deciding on legislative matters is Democracy OS. This is an Argentinian developed software. So 
this is like a this is a recent screenshot from the New Hampshire State House, and you can see okay, this that and the other thing is coming up. It's kind of passive, like you know, you know what's happening, but you can take that and you can put up a piece of legislation, for example, and ask your constituents, how do you want me to vote on this legislation? And again, they can comment, you know, tell you what they think about it, tell each other what they think about it or what they think the pros and cons of it are, or you know, if it should be changed. Maybe they have suggestions for what they'd like you to ask in committee. Um, and then they can say, yeah, we want you to vote in favor of it, or we don't want you to vote in favor of it. So it's very handy for those things where you don't know what your constituents want, you're not quite sure what they want you to do. Um, and it's very good for constituents, of course, to be controlling their representatives and make sure that they don't run away uh, with all of the loot the moment they're elected. And last but not least, something I particularly like is participatory budgeting. So participatory budgeting is actually used in a lot of places offline. It's even used in the states uh, offline in Boston, for example, they use it but offline so they don't have very good participation numbers. This is a screenshot from Paris uh, where they've begun to use this online. Actually, they've been doing it for two or three years. This is a very small screenshot. There's actually quite a lot of projects on here. So what they do is they say, we will set aside 5% of the budget and you guys tell us what you want us to do with that money. Um, in this particular example, keeping the streets more clean, uh, one, uh, some, one bit of the vote anyway, uh, which I thought was really funny because it was just like in Athens where they were always trying to keep their streets clean. It seems to be a perpetual issue. Um, but it's actually quite good because instead of the government just spending the money, you say, what we, what we want you to spend it on, you can do it, of course, with a larger percentage of the budget. Um, they do 5%. A variation on that would be to be able to say, you can say, what you want your tax money to go to. So people can say, okay, where would you like your tax money to be spent on? Do you want it to be spent on education or as a culture, what you can pick? So you can expand that out. And it's something you can do on a municipal level, like right away, basically, if you have municipal councillors. So there's a lot of ways to get to direct democracy. It's a bit of a crossroads, but we can start inching forward on that now because you don't need permission to do any of these things. They're totally legal. Um, you can directly control your representatives, tell them what you want them to do. You can crowdsource policy proposals, you know, maybe things that you want them to bring forward um, in the House. You can start using participatory budgeting, municipal level, even state level, if you can make that happen. Um, and of course, all of this is on the way to full direct democracy. Um, and I think that it's very, very important that we take this chance because we're kind of at a crossroads as far as technology is concerned. We can see technology being used in ways that are very concerning. You know, surveillance, privacy, drone warfare, things like this, I think are worrisome to us all. So I think there's a very important question to be asked. How can we use technology to bring power back to people? And I really think we should take that chance while it's going because I don't think that that window is going to be open forever. So I went into this in a little bit more detail in my book, if you're interested. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm not sure how much time we have left. I tried to speak quickly, <laughs> um, but uh, if we don't have time, I'm around the rest of the day. <laughs>